Okay, we're continuing here in Christian ethics. We're going to talk about schooling. Uh, we're going to talk about um, male and female uh, relationships. So this ought to be interesting, uh, no shortage of controversy. And I think you'll find this, um, I, I know I did, I, I found this fascinating. So, so we already talked about public schools, okay, the benefits. I mean, a lot of times you've got really good teachers, uh, really good facilities. Given the fact that they extract tax dollars from citizens who have no say in the matter, they've got a lot of money. I'm being a little playful, but they do. they got lots of money to work with. So you're going to have a lot more amenities and benefits, you know, probably better bands than Christian schools, probably better football teams. Than, you know, you can go through the list, usually. Compare Alabama's football team with Liberty's. Okay. We can go on and on. But, but, you know, so, so there's lots of benefits. There, there are. Um, uh, uh, some Christians, um, one of which is yours truly, feel a sense of calling to go into the public schools and be a light and a witness as a teacher in some capacity. So, so there's lots of benefits there. But, but again, I love how he presents this because he presents pros and cons of both. And he, he sides on the fact that, hey, parents, if you're going to delegate the responsibility of teaching to, your, to, to, to teachers other than yourself, just realize you're going to be accountable to God for it. So just choose wisely. I, I think that's a great way to present it. Because you can get, you know, you can get in some deep weeds, you can get Christians really animated. It's got to be public schools or nothing. It's got to be Christian schools or nothing. It's got to be homeschooling. It, it, it's interesting. But, but God gives us a choice, and you've got to make good decisions, and you have to answer to God for it. Um, so anyway, so before we get to Christian schools and homeschooling, um, you know, I think some thoughts. I, I Admittedly, some of these ideas are not from the textbook. These ideas are from yesterday's Breakpoint, if, you're, if you subscribe to Breakpoint. Uh, and, and the Friday summation of the week. I thought they did a great job of talking about this. And these are some, I, I thought this is great food for thought. You know, does, does the Christian worldview have anything to say about education or does it just deal with spiritual things? You know, because a lot of Christians, Christian parents never think it through. And so they just, they just uh, the default setting is I just send my kid to the public schools. And they never think, wait a minute, does, does God say anything about education at all? I mean, is it a good thing to send your kid to purely secular schools or not? I mean, if, if you think that Christianity doesn't apply to education, then yeah, you would have no qualms of sending a kid to a secular school. Why not? No, no, God doesn't say anything about it, so what's the big deal? Now, I'm, again, I'm caricaturing a little bit, but, but I mean, a lot of Christian parents really don't think about it. Now, in the last two, three years, with COVID and all that's been exposed, critical race theory, all this sexual grooming and weirdness and perversions coming through in the schools. You know, a lot of the parents who never cared about, the Christian parents who never cared about the kids' education, suddenly now in a remote setting, they were able to watch the kids' Zoom classes. And they got to actually hear what's being taught in classes. And suddenly like, whoa, hold on. And suddenly Mama Bear and Papa Bear started rising up at school board meetings and go, excuse me, uh, I got a big problem with this, right? So, so, you know, again, I, I think a lot of Christian parents' eyes have been opened in the last two, three years, and that's a good thing. Um, was this stuff already there? Yeah, it was already there. It's just suddenly now it got exposed. Um, let's remember that education is discipleship. Which serves which? You know, that's a great question for Christians that are very much in favor of public education. Does education serve discipleship or does discipleship serve education? What do you think? From a biblical perspective. Discipleship serves education. Yeah. Well, no, no, education should serve discipleship. Right? In, 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 other words, in other words, education is discipleship. So education should not lead. Discipleship should lead. And so education flows from that discipling element, right? So you got to be real careful about, again, I'm the product of secular education, probably everyone in this room is. But we've got to understand from a Christian perspective, education is supposed to serve the purposes of discipleship. Another point we need to realize is, let's remember that discipleship or spiritual formation happens all the time. 
I mean, I, hey, finally, finally, we're moving through Romans 11 and I get to char start with Romans 12, the fun stuff, right? I've been waiting for this for a long time. You try preaching through Romans 9 through 11, okay? There's a lot there and it's been a challenge for me to try to make it as practical, you know, because you're like, this is deep theological weeds, okay? Well, what does Romans 12, 1 and 2 say, right? Do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This transformation or this, con this, this conforming or formation happens all the time. What, if you're in church and in a Sunday school class right now, spiritual formation is happening. But Thursday at 2 p.m. in your average public high school, spiritual formation is happening as well. Right? In other words, don't, don't reserve discipleship for Christians. Discipling happens all the time. There's a lot of really well-discipled Marxists in colleges and universities trumpeting cultural Marxism to all these boys and girls that are 18 and 19. Right? Right? They're being discipled all the time. So we got to realize that. Don't just revert discipleship to a Christian setting. It's happening all the time. And so when you send your kids to a public school, realize they're going to be discipled in something. The workplace is doing that as well. Yeah, the, yes. Woke capitalism, anyone? Okay, the media, news outlets. Yeah, all, right? That, that's all discipleship. Let, let's recognize that and, and not just relegate it to just in a Christian setting. The issue is, is it good discipleship or bad discipleship? Is it discipleship that's leading you more toward the Lord or away from the Lord? Okay. What if what, and here's another point, what if what the kids are learning, being discipled in public schools, is antithetical to the Christian worldview? Right? Again, a lot of Christian parents who send their kids to public schools and love the public schools need to answer that question. If, if, if they're being sent every day in a setting that is, that is discipling them away from Christian principles, are you okay with that? And do you have some safety mechanisms in place to mitigate that? Well, what is that? Well, as a parent, do you have discussions about that at the dinner table? Do you, do you, do you impress upon them Christian principles so, so that it offsets all of that ungodly teaching? Do you make sure they're in youth group every time the door is opened? Or is school sports more important for you? And so they're not going to, uh, they're not going to youth group. They're, they're actually going to the sports because that's more, right? We, discipleship happens all the time. And so you got to realize that. And some might say, because I can hear Christ, Christian parents who are very supportive of public schools say, well, there's no anti-Christian teaching in my school. But the very basis of a secular education is out of sight, out of mind. So they may not say anything anti-Christian, but if they don't talk about a Christian worldview, if they don't talk about God, if they don't talk about uh, the Christian influence on society, hospitals, right, uh, uh, orphanages, saving the, the, the uh, you know, the underprivileged, uh, elevation of women, I mean, I could go through on and on what Christianity has done. If you don't talk about it, it becomes out of sight, out of mind. And so Christian kids grow up thinking that Christianity and Christian influences had nothing to do with world history, right? That's what a secular education gives us. So as a parent, if you understand that, then what are you going to do to offset that? Right? Again, a lot of Christian parents don't think that through. And so I, I think these are good points. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I moved my daughter last week, okay? Some, I think... Some folks said, hey, did you enjoy your vacation? I'm like, it wasn't a vacation. Do you understand? We were moving beds and dressers up and down three flights of stairs and down hills and stuff. So, yeah, it was my back was really sore coming back. Um, but she's at a purely secular school now. She's not at the comfy confines of Liberty University. One of her professors is a lesbian who's married. And, and we talked about this a year ago. I said, honey, if you go to a secular school, you realize you're going to be outside the Christian bubble. And she said, well, dad, but I'll have you to help me. And she meant that seriously. She said, if I get stuck in deep weeds theologically or some stuff. So, so right now we're talking about she, she's in, you know, she, she's going, she's going to graduate degree in diet and exercise science. There's a technical name for it. I forget every time. Don't ask. Me. But. One of the things that she's in a class for is food policy, government food policy. 
And the, what do you think the default setting for government food policy is in this secular school? What's the default setting? What should the government do when it comes to food? Or should it? What do you think? The default setting of the teacher and the default setting of most of the students is it is the federal government's job to feed underprivileged people. It's the federal government's job to set nutritional standards. It's the federal government's job to help people that cannot feed themselves. So Lexi's like, um, shouldn't that be done at the state and local level? And people, and the pushback was like, well, you're going to get blue states and red states, and they're going to argue, and so, and so it should be done at the federal level. And so Lexi and I have been having some incredible conversations and text, texting back and forth. Dad, give me some stuff. You know, and, and you know, I've been trying to help her to say, wait a minute, first of all, from a constitutional level, the federal government was never supposed to be in the food business. It was never supposed to be in the school lunch business. It was never meant to be. It was always meant to be done at the state and local level. Per the Constitution, morals, health, police power, and aid to underprivileged people was always meant to be done at the state and local level. Was never meant to be nationalized. So I said, you gotta take that into consideration. I said, here's another question you need to ask your teacher in your class. What does it mean to be human? Oh, Dad, no, you're getting, no, ask that question. What do you mean, Dad? I said. Well, are humans free moral agents that are capable of using reason to think through things and govern themselves? Or are human beings not free moral agents? They don't have reason. They're incapable of governing themselves. There's nothing more than victims. Are human beings the crown of creation and capable of governing themselves and using reason? Or are human beings nothing more than animals or slaves that can be controlled by a master with a leash? I said, those are the points you need to bring up with your class. What does it mean to be human? Because your government, that good government policy reflects a true picture of what it means to be human. The second thing is that here's another thing you ought to bring up in class. What is the purpose of government? Is the purpose of government to give you stuff to provide for you as in a nanny state? Or is the purpose of government to secure your pre-existing human rights or actually natural rights? Because the first one will create a nanny state and relegate the citizens to children, unthinking children who can't think for themselves and govern themselves. The second one reflects human dignity made in the image of God and forces them and provokes them to take moral responsibility for their choices. Government should not tell you what size soft drink you should drink. You decide what size soft drink you drink or whether you should drink one or at all or maybe have water. Anyway. These are the things, okay, this is the kind of discipleship stuff that you can do at home that can mitigate the effects of a secular education. Okay, you know, I, I'm having to do with it, but it was, it was actually, I, I, was, I was like, thank you, Lexi, because she said, Dad, I'll be okay because I have you. And I'm not saying that to make me feel better, but she was like, I, I, you will help me navigate this stuff because I realize I'm going to have to deal with this stuff. Because she goes, I don't know the Constitution like you do. I don't know government like you do. So help me. So anyway, this is the stuff we've been talking about. It's been fun. It's is she been, as vocal as she is? Huh? Is she as vocal? Oh, she's more than me. She's more vocal so than she, I am. That would... Oh yeah, she's she's much more vocal than I am. In that way, she's more like her mom. Just she's, like... I can be vocal too, but no. She, well, sometimes she'll get passive because she's. I don't know what this. I don't know how to counter this. But if she knows how to counter something, she'll. Okay, let's. Okay, let's go. So anyway. And saying all that to say, these are things we need to think of when we're, you know, because again, I'm not against public school education, secular, because again, I am a secular school teacher. I'm in it. But you got to, parents got to wrestle this stuff out. Um, okay. So argument for sending students to those Christian schools, we kinda, I'm just going to go over this rather quickly, okay, because it's fairly self-evident. 
Um, all of a child's education should be Bible-centered and God-centered. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Right? I mean, that's, that's part of education, okay? And, and so that, that's the value of Christian education. Um, you know, the contrast in this verse, do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, suggests that training that is not of the Lord will prove frustrating to students and even provoke them to anger. I can, that's, yeah, I get very angry when I see, you know, gender dysphoria taught as normal. I get very angry when I see, you know, transgender story hour or whatever they're doing in these public high school, public libraries throughout our country for little children. You know, all, you know, so, yeah. While church training might account for three to five hours a week, 3% to 5% of a child's waking hours, training in a school is 30 to 40 hours a week, right? Nearly 10 times as much as church. You, you got to realize that. Again, this is... This is 15 years of youth ministry here speaking. This is 10 years of indirect youth ministry down in Illinois speaking. I, I was always aghast at how Christian parents who claim to love Jesus and claim to be Christian and so on and so forth will defer when it comes to school activities, the sports, the plays, the dramas, the whatever, they'll make sure their kids are at that, but they're very quick to blow off <coughs> the youth group. That, 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 that was just always something I was just like, oh my gosh, do you understand what you're doing to your kids? Because that's spiritual formation. You are communicating that sports are more important than God, the church. And if they learn it, again, what you do when they're young, they'll keep Though that, that has a big effect on their lives. How much of you and I and our current behavior today is a reflective of something that happened to us when we were kids? Good or bad. It's the same thing. You know, parents communicating, hey, sports are more. I mean, I, I remember when my son was playing traveling baseball in Illinois and the coaches, yeah, we're having practice at eight on Sunday. And I just went to the coach, sorry, you know, two things. Number one, multiple things. Number one, we're Christians. We're at church on Sunday. Number two, my son is not going. Number three, I do not want him to be negatively impacted by this choice. And we had some awkward conversations with coaches. But, and I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm, I was the best or what parent in that area, but a lot of Christian parents, hey, that's when the coach has practice. That's when we're doing it. Yeah, it's tough. Education should be positive and truthful, okay? In other words, um, I don't think any verse of Scripture encourages parents to give their children secular training that will strengthen them. Train a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. On the other hand, they may become more callous and desensitized to the sinful behavior of others around them, okay? In other words, that can happen to secular school. Can I also say this? I want to be very careful. I went to Oral Roberts University. Lexi has told me stories of what goes on behind the scenes at Liberty. Just because they're at a Christian school doesn't mean that they're going to see godly Christian behavior all the time by the students. Let's not be naive. The same sin that's at a secular school, they're at Christian schools. It's just kept. Some, I, I could go through the list of many prominent charismatic leaders today. I went to school with their kids. And their kids were kids. hellions. No, don't say preacher kids because I'll, I'll I'll push back on that because I you know we have kids you know as a pastor that's really hard to do you know because you're in a bubble. But just the the common denominator for all these kids of these famous was we we lived in such a controlled environment in our homes that once we're out of it, I just had to flex my wings a little bit. And, but, but some of them went way to the other, you know. It's, you know it's, it's what every child of a Christian parent has to deal with. Do I have a relationship with Jesus on my own or am I living off my mom and dad's coattails? You know, every kid's got to deal with that. But it was... I did. I can remember getting out of high school and 
just trying to, and now I didn't go way overboard, but it was like I was out of my parents' faith. I had to find out what I actually believed in. Yeah. I strayed for a, a while and was yeah. rebellious. So, yeah. but then the, all the things that had been planted into me got me back yeah. to center. And yeah. And so I, 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 I just saw it. I could, I could, if I mention the names, you will know all of these people. I promise you. Um, you know, I went to school with Joel Osteen's sister, for goodness sakes, you know. Um, peer, okay, I mean, again, some of this base. Peer influence should be positive and Christ-like. Obviously, at a Christian school, you're going to get more of that in a secular school. But again, it's what I've told my, my kids since they were little. People are like water. They seek their own level. So at a secular school, if you're a strong Christian, you love Jesus, you're going to seek strong Christians there. If you're not, you'll seek the party scene. Same thing at a Christian school. You'll seek your own level. Whatever you are, you're going to seek those types of friends and those types of relationships. And so don't blame it on everyone else. Look at yourself first. Every teacher's pattern of life should be worthy of imitation. Obviously, my daughter has a lesbian as a teacher. Now. Is that worthy of imitation? Don't think so, right? In other words, the argument is in a Christian school, you've got Christian teachers that are godly that, you know, kids are going to want to follow that. That's important. The, the, the converse of that is true, right? Is, is that that same idea? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who's fully trained will be like his teacher. So again, that, that's an argument for Christian teachers, okay? Um, only God-centered education gives us true wisdom, right? The fear of the Lord is the... Beginning of wisdom. So <laughs> if you don't have the fear of the Lord in a secular setting, are you going to get wisdom? No. You're going to get lots of knowledge. You're going to learn lots of stuff. But you're not going to get true wisdom, the fear of the Lord, which causes everything. Right. Because what does the fear of the Lord do? It humbles you. There's a lot of very arrogant, learned people in academia. Right. They don't have the fear of the Lord. There's no humility there. They're They've been, in the words of Chuck Colson, educated to the point of imbecility. I love that line. Isn't that a great line? Yeah. Educated to the point of imbecility. Um, let's see. Um, let me just read this quote. I think, I think this is a good quote from the textbook. Um, New York University professor of psychology Paul Vitz carried out an extensive examination of 90 widely used public school textbooks in reading, social studies, and history. He discovered a nearly absolute omission of any positive mentions of Protestant history, Jewish and Christian contributions to historical events, conservative political views, private business activity, marriage, heroic roles for boys or men, or the value of motherhood or homemaking. In other words, these are in the major textbooks. So in a secular school, these kids are, you know, again, this is the out of sight, out of mind thing. I mean, it was only later on when I went to Oral Roberts University um, and, and that I really realized the Christian influence on history. Because I'd never, it, it, I'd never, at Lakeshore High School, never, never got it. Never, never, they didn't teach it in, in their school system. It, didn't, it just, it wasn't, again, it wasn't anti-Christian, but it was Again, out of sight, out of mind. It just wasn't there. It's, it's not there. And then today you throw in the 1619 Project, right? If you know all the textbooks associated with that, you guys know what the 1619 Project is. It's, it's a rewriting of American history that America was not founded in 1776, but it was founded in 1619 when the first slaves came. So it's all a grievance culture view of American history that's in, that, that's in high schools and colleges today. Yeah, the 1619 Project. So it's all based on well, America was founded on a, on on a, um, on, on a injustice. So it's American history through the lenses of injustice. And did we treat African Americans poorly? White people sure they did. Did many Christians treat Native Americans poorly? Yes, they did. Did many Christians treat fellow Christians poorly when it came to freedom of religion? Yes, they did. So? Yeah, it's there. But I, that just because there's a blemish doesn't mean you throw out the baby with the bathwater. And it's definitely not worthy of my time or anyone's time to look at life through a grievance lens. 
What does the Bible say about offenses, right? A root of bitterness springing up defiling many. That's what the 1619 Project is. It's a root of bitterness that's defiling all kinds of people. Now I've got a burr in my saddle against America. And I'm upset at all the founders because they were frauds or whatever. I mean, really? You're going to really? do that? You're going to look at every... I mean, what a miserable place to be as a person. Sorry, I'll start preaching. Same comedy, stuff. Level or just comedy? Oh, high school, college. Yeah. 1619 Project. Look it up. Yeah. Totally, total revision, historical revisionism. Total revisioning of America's founding. Forget 1776 was, was a fraud, a lie, um, injustice. Look at, through, look at life through the lens of, of the oppressed peoples. It's Marxist. It's Marxist. Um, high academic standards. Again, you know, a, a lot of Christian schools are very high academic standards. I don't know. I would put the education I got at Regent University in grad school against any secular school, at least in political theory. I, I, I don't think it, I, I don't think Harvard or any other school holds it. I mean, I, I think it's just as good. I do. And I, well, that's because you would, yeah, maybe, but I just, I don't know. I've been able to hold my own fairly well in teaching in a secular setting. You know, I've had many uh, students say, what, what, where did you go to school? I've never heard, I, I've never heard it taught, you know. So I, I know it's, it's making any difference. But anyway, arguments for homeschooling, okay? Who's the teacher of the children from a biblical perspective? Parents, parents are the primary teachers, right? And, and you know, if, if nothing else, what homeschooling communicates to us is so often Christian parents punt to someone else when they don't realize, wait a minute, right? Who is the youth pastor of, your, of the kids? It's not Christy, it's not the youth pastor, it's the parents. They're the primary youth leaders, or should be. Now, Yes, we have surrogates, we have others that help out, we have teachers and blah, blah. But I mean, from a biblical perspective, education, discipleship, is first and foremost the parent's job. Not the youth pastor, not the teachers. Right? But when you're working lots of hours and it's hectic and blah, blah, blah. And again, I, is, there, is there a problem with deferring to a youth pastor? Is there a problem to deferring to a teacher? No, but realize... As a, before God, you parents are held accountable for the education. So if that education is not going well, or if they're becoming pagans <laughs> through their educational system, that's on you. Before you blame the school, blame yourself. You, you, you punted to that educational institution. That's a biblical understanding of that. That's, that. That goes down like a rat sandwich with a lot of parents. Well, it's the school's fault. Yes, the school, but... You as a parent, you sent them there, and God's gonna, you're going to stand before God and answer to the school you sent your kids to. No pressure, right? The most significant learning occurs in companionship, and parents are the best companions for young children. I mean, isn't that one of the moves within our culture in America, is that the state will do a better job of taking care of our kids? I mean, just take, again, forgive me for railing on it, but it's just it's the most current issue, the whole transgender thing, and you got a kid that's seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, want to transition, goes to the school counselor, and then suddenly mom and dad find out, and they say no. And I mean, there was a legal case that just went through that basically the parent lost on all counts. And so they had no say in the kid's decision to transition. The court deferred completely to the school system, which the school system is the state, right? And their decision to have that kid transition and have a of the surgery and parents could say nothing okay but the most significant learning is, is parents from a biblical perspective right let's not get caught up in what the world says <laughs> it's it's a bit that's yeah we got to recognize that a child's companions at public school or christian school may not be the best influence on the child so that's why a lot of kids parents homeschool and that's true okay you know uh, bad company corrupts good morals now, the counter argument to that is, yeah, but if the kids stay in a bubble all their lives, they're going to get blown away in college. And so you probably should let them go to a secular school to take a class or two while they're being homeschooled, I think. I, you know, because 
if you suddenly go to college without with being in mom's house, mom and dad's house the whole time, wow, it's a lot. It's a big culture shock. But again, I can't make the call for the parent. But I, my suggestion as a parent, my pastoral recommendation is, hey, let them take a class at LMC or a local high school, even as they're at home with you, so they can ease into this thing. Because once you get to, you know, even a Christian school sometimes can be overwhelming to a kid that was homeschooled all their lives. It can be. Um, training in moral standards is, is, is important as academic training. Right? In other words, when you get into secular school, it's all academics. There is no more morals training. You know, you're, not, you're not training to be a better person in school. We're training you to get a job. If you want to do that stuff, do it at church. That, that's, I'm not saying people are saying, but that, that's, that's what's communicated. Hey, we'll teach you how to you know, split infinitives. <laughs> we'll teach you how to parse verbs, parse nouns. We'll, we'll teach you how to you know, le learn the, 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 um, you know, the, the atomic table. But as far as moral training, we don't do that here. Right? And so that's why a lot of parents are like, I'm not, I'm not sending my, I want my kids to be morally you know, trained. I, I, it's not happening in a public school, so I'm doing it at home. Remember, I, did I tell you this before? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But um, in, in the phenomenal book, uh, The Making of the Modern University by Julie Rubin, it came out about 10, 15 years ago. She talks about how, how major universities became secularized. And so what, by, by the early 1900s, science and scientific knowledge has, had ran roughshod over religious teaching. Okay, this is where we initially get the idea that people don't have a sin problem. Okay, people just have problems, which opened the way to the legitimation of homosexual conduct and all these things we have today. In other words, it's not a sin, it's a problem. So anyway, so that's going on. So, so they're like, oh, but, but kids don't need morals training. They still need, they still need to learn right and wrong and truth. So where are we going to teach it? We can't teach it in the chemistry lab. We can't teach it in the med school. We can't teach it in biology class. Let's do it in the humanities. Let's do it through history and through government and things like that. Well, then the, the history teachers and the government teachers and humanities teachers are like, we don't have time to waste on that kind of stuff. We're trying to teach them history or government, whatever. So they decided, oh, I know where kids are going to learn morals. They're going to learn it in the dorms. And they're going to learn it on the athletic field in sports. So by the 1930s, colleges as a whole punted any type of morals training or ethics to dorm life and sports. How, how well has that worked out? What's, what's the average dorm like in a college? Do you know? What's it like? Is it highly ethical and moral and virtuous? Or is it animal house or something in between? But anyway, but that's what they thought. Because again, once the Christian worldview was jettisoned in higher academia, they still, they, they tried to do something with morals because they said, wait a minute, Christianity will not teach us morals, now science will. Science will teach us morals. Which again, think eugenics, think Birkenau and Auschwitz, right? How, how did science work out teaching morals by the 1930s and 40s? It was not good. So they tried to do something with it. So they relegated it to sports and dorms. That's just a little, that's an aside. Great book. That's a wonderful book. The moral um, standards are being taught, and if not, um, not godly morals, but morals are being taught in school. Exactly, yes, and, that is true. And that the absence of is also amoral, and amoral society is a default society. Yeah, well, and okay, we're in, we're in an ethics class. What type of ethics is taught in, in secular schools? DEI. On the what? DEI and SEL. What's that? The diversity, equity, inclusion, and G. Yeah. yeah. And we, uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff. But what we, remember the first couple of weeks of class, we talked about secular ethics is utilitarian. Christian ethics is deontological. Okay, deontological is we're duty-bound to obey God. So, so our ethics, are in a transcendent sense, I am duty-bound to obey God through his word. That's fixed and permanent. Secular ethics, of which all of that diversity and inclusion, inclusion will flow from it, is relativistic. There is no agreed-upon standard. So what is utilitarian ethics, remember? It's the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. So in other words, it's, it's, it's ethics under the sun. 
Christian ethics is deontological. It's transcendent. It's above the sun, so to speak. It's from God, and it's fixed and permanent, and I'm duty-bound to obey it. I can't go against my conscience. Secular ethics, which is utilitarian, is greatest good for the greatest amount of people, and because it's relativistic, in other words, there is no foundation of truth that's fixed and permanent, diversity and inclusion and all that kind of stuff begins to rule the day. That seems getting away from the value. The greatest gift and greatest um, people. Yeah, people. utilitarian. And they're saying, yes, and they're saying that it's more, no, my ethics, what I want to do, what yeah. I expect to do. And now it's individualistic. It's not even utilitarian. Well, it's utilitarian in the sense that the greatest good for the greatest amount of people now becomes very subjective. In other words, it starts collapsing on itself. It's not sustainable. I mean, not even utilitarian ethics is sustainable now in the new, it's all about me and my own personal ethics. In other words, how can you sustain the greatest good for the greatest amount of people because it's so individualistic? It's, it's going to, well, it's, our society cannot continue to go on this way. It's, the rule of law is going to break down because everyone becomes a law to themselves. And that's a recipe for anarchy. It's anarchy. In other words, what happened in the summer of 2020 will be a rule, not an exception. If everyone becomes a lot of themselves. You can't govern a people that way. Well, you can. Yeah, actually, you can govern people that way. It becomes a tyranny. You'll see something. If this keeps going, I predict. If this keeps going on the way it is, all this relativistic, it's all about me ethics, it will devolve into some form of a dictatorship and a social credit system not unlike China. That's my prediction, <laughs> if it keeps going. We're going there now. We're going there. Well, then it's not much of a prediction then. I mean, you know, but I mean, it's, it's that, because the, the way our system of government is set up is there's gotta be some transcendent moral framework that holds politicians and, 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 and the people accountable. If that's gone and everyone becomes a law to themselves, again, it's, it's what James Madison said in Federalist 55. He said, only the chains of despotism will keep that kind of a people in check. Again, again, look at, look at China's social credit system if you want to see a preview of coming attractions. Political correctness. If you speak against the government, you lose credit. And now you can't travel as much. You may not be able to get gasoline now. So you may not be able to travel. You may not be able to go to the nicest grocery store. All that kind of stuff is, is controlled by government surveillance of what you're doing and saying in social media and whatever. That, that's how they're doing it in China. They're controlling people that way. So now money is not really important anymore. It's social credit. That's frightening. But that, again, morals actually really matter. Virtue really matters if you're going to have limited government. If you don't want limited government, then yeah, fine. Welcome the dictator. That's why I teach. That's why I'm, I'm looking forward because last semester I, I taught all international relations, which is a cool class, which I love world history and stuff. But I, we're going back to, I'm teaching four American national government classes. So now we're getting back to the Constitution and we can start talking about it. Because I, and I, I tend to pose it to the students as questions. I will not be this open about it, but I'll say, okay, if you want to go that way, if it's all about your own personal choice to be transgender, whatever, what kind of government are we going to have with it? So I, I just, I throw those questions out to try to get them thinking the logical conclusions. Have you read Federalist 55 that I assigned last week? What does it say at the very end? What does it say? And we get into those kind of things. I, I love that stuff. Um, anyway, homeschool children on average are, are ex excellent kids, excellent students. You know, anecdotally, as, when I was a youth pastor, man, I had some brilliant kids that were homeschooled that graduated high school at 15 or 16. Socially, they're a little bit awkward because they didn't have all that social interaction. But oh my goodness, if you want to, you, know, um, you know, split an atom, I would just talk to these kids. Hey, how's your centrifuge going? You know, I'm kidding, but they, they were really smart. Okay, um, why is it doing this? I don't know. Um, just, here's a quick stat before I end this. I, and I don't know why it's, it's looking funky on my screen. I'm going to get out of that and maybe it'll no it's not let me do it thanks um in the census bureau oh there it is now you can see it well it'll, it'll get on. um according to the census bureau the percentage of households with children being homeschooled has doubled from 
it should be, um, it was 4% uh, during the 2019-2020 school year to 11% in 2020 to 2021. Among black households, it increased nearly five-fold from 3.3% to 16% a year. So homeschooling, because of COVID and all that stuff, first of all, like kids learn better with actual a, a teacher in person or something, but I, they were also seeing through Zoom all the things that were taught. I'm like, I'm not sending my kid to that. Anyway, so, and, and, and where he comes down on, again, I, I love how he, he presents this well. Let me see if I can get the slideshow up so you can see it better. Um, here's what he says. He says, in, in evaluating these three options, it is important to compare apples to apples. It's not appropriate to compare a good public school to a bad example of a Christian school or vice versa. It is best when thinking of this issue as a theoretical question, as in ethics, to compare the best examples of all three types of schooling. But then, of course, each family must make a decision each year according to the circumstances which they live. Finally, there's widespread concern about the tragic decline in educational achievement. And he said, parents, you've got to make a decision. And I would go farther and say, parents, you're going to have to answer to God for the school you sent your kid to. So choose wisely. And if they're going all secular, you better be prepared to help them, teach them on the side to help them. I'm doing that in a surrogate role with my daughter, even if she's in Raleigh, North Carolina right now, you know, because she's in, and the irony of the school she's at, it's called um, Meredith College, it's an all girls school. It was founded in 1909 by Baptists. Anyway, it's just like, okay, all right. Interesting, yeah. Neat school. Raleigh Durham's a cool area, it's big, it's huge. Half million people in, in Raleigh, a quarter of a million people in Durham, about a million people in the general area there. Um, just big, lots of traffic, man. Um, what cities yeah, we, and you have 14 universities within a general, I don't know, 10 mile, you know, North Carolina, NC State, Duke, and then a, bu a bunch of other schools. So like I, like I said to the advisory council meeting, uh, when you go to a Target or Walmart, it's like it's been scavenged. I mean, all, you know, it's because all these college kids are trying to get stuff for their apartments. It's like, it's all gone. We're like, great. Yeah. All right. So again, we're in the section in ethics called human authority. So we started with parental authority. Now we're talking about authority in marriage. And again, no sparks ever fly here, right? No sparks ever fly in a marriage when it comes to authority. Okay. So <laughs> equality and leadership in marriage. Um, and, and I'm the only guy, so I've got to go strong because I'm, I'm, I'm outnumbered, okay? How can husbands have a leadership role in marriage if men and women are equal in value before God? Because we're going to talk a lot about headship here. How should a husband's headship and a wife's support of that headship work out in practice? What are the arguments used by evangelical feminists today? Okay, so there's two positions generally within evangelical Christianity about husband's and wife's role. There's a complementarian role of view and there's the egalitarian role. Okay, the egalitarian is Christian, is feminism to some degree, okay? Complementarianism is this, men and women are equal when God has ordained different roles for them in marriage, okay? That, my friends, is most likely the orthodox position and the position you're probably most familiar with, okay? We're equal, but there's different roles that we play. Okay, there's a unique leadership role for men in marriage and in the church. Okay, the egalitarian position is different. Again, the, he calls this evangelical feminism is that men and women are equal and there are no specific roles in marriage. Egalitarians deny that there's a unique leadership role for men in marriage and the church. Okay, and Probably here we won't get that fired up, but <laughs> like they talked about this at Liberty, and okay, the Southern Baptist position is there are no women pastors. If you're a woman pastor, you're out. Okay, in the assemblies of God and 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 more um, uh, charismatic Holy Ghost churches, there is a role carved out for women in the pastoral position. Okay. That would not fly in a Baptist setting. Can you find an example of a woman pastor in the in the Bible, in the New Testament? Yeah. 
I think you'd find you'd be hard hard pressed, especially in the Book of Acts, to find any example of a pastor in general, much less a woman pastor. You might find elders and deacons, and you definitely see prophets and, and, and apostles, but it's hard to find a pat. You don't really see a pastor mentioned. If you can, show it to me. I don't think you can. But in the rest of the New Testament, do you see an example of a woman pastor? You can't. And that's part of the argument that the Baptists make. Now, they also use the argument in 1 Timothy about, hey, I do not allow a woman to teach a man. They must be in quiet subjection. So that you can imagine that, you know, John MacArthur jumps on that one big time. Okay? The position of the Assemblies of God and, and um, Charismatic Churches, Holy Ghost Churches, is the same Holy Spirit dwells in both, and the Holy Spirit can use both in different roles. So they would defer toward women pastors. There's not a lot in the Assemblies of God, but there are some. There's provision made out to them. Um, my position is that, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't take the Baptist position. And I don't, I think, I think God can raise up women to be used in that way. It's just, it's not often that it happens, but it does. You can see women apostles in the New Testament. You can see women prophets. You, you see the diversity of gifts talked about in, in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12. And it says the Holy Spirit gives to each severally as he wills. So if he's given it apostleship to a woman and prophetic ministry to a woman, and it, it, there's not... Paul doesn't say it as in, okay, it's just this and it's just this. It just says the Holy Spirit's going to do it. My position is, who am I to say if the Holy Spirit does that, then hey. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of? I mean, this is not as controversial for us in, in the Assemblies of God Church, but oh my gosh. If this was a Baptist class, it would be interesting. But you would be a pastor and not a pastor of a church. Right. I, mean, I know a lot of women who have that pastoral gifting. Give, I'll say it. Okay, I'll say it right now, loud and proud. My wife is far more pastoral than I am. I've known that for thirty years. It's true, she's got more of a giftedness to in a pastoral sense. How many? I'm not walking around with everyone. Hey, I love you. I'm, of course, it would probably be weird, but but it, you know, she could pull it off. Anyway, were you going to say something, Don? I think more women have a pastoral gift. If you're going to say that. Because women tend to be more nurturing. Nurture, yeah, I was just the nurture and that's, element. And that's the gift and the role of the pastor is the shepherd and the you know the, the tender of the soul. Women yeah. tend to have that. Personally, I have a real hard time submitting to a female pastor. I, I don't personally. I don't think go to church or a female pastor would be a pastor. I don't think. I don't think that. I want to be able to submit to a man. His leadership. Yeah. I, it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. It's who does the kid go to when they scrape their knee? Mama or Papa? Mom! Right? It's like Barbara Yoder, she's a pastor of her church, but she has, she's apostolic. So maybe it's that gifting. I mean, I would sit under her because I know she's other apostolic gifting rather than. Shepherd. Yeah, but it, it's it's a controversial. You know, it's somewhat controversial in AG circles, but not as much. They're much more open to it. Um, again, I has it always been in the AG church that women have that freedom? Yeah, the, the, has culture changed it? Too? No, I mean, you know, the whole feminism thing clouded everything back in the late fifties, early sixties, and stuff. But before then. You know, the Holy Spirit fell at Azusa Street on women and men. You know, a lot of more women. You know, the church has historically had more women than men, anyway. But the giftedness that came on, a lot women tend to be used more in the assemblies of God in, in a lot of well nurturing roles. I would say for sure. A um, lot, lot of spiritual gifts and things. You know, as far as charismatic, the charismatic gifts for sure. But. Okay, I'll say it. 
you know, I'm probably halfway between the Baptist position and Doc Sherry's position. And so, you know, I'm kind of in the middle on that. It would be harder for me, I'd probably like Doc Sherry to submit to a woman, not, not because of a, of a chauvinistic thing, but I just, you know, you know, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about a woman must be under authority and there's got to be a covering. It's not just a head covering, but I mean, it's, I believe a spiritual covering. Where is that at? You know, women as a pastor. Now you could say, well, they're submitted to the Presbytery of the Assemblies of God or something like that. Well, they're bored. Right. Yeah, but yeah, but but anyway, it's 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 interesting how that all works out. It's it's easier to look towards a male pastor than a female pastor because. In a sense, women think of men with more authority because the word says that man was created before woman. Yeah, and, and we're going to get into that here yeah. in this section. You know, because the thing they talk about is, hey, Eve sinned, so why didn't God go hard on Eve? I mean, he did. He did. But, 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 but he, yeah. he specifically, not just in Genesis 3, but in, yeah, I, yeah. Trust me, if Christy were here, she'd be nudging me. But look at Romans 5. Look at other examples. When, he, when he's talking about the first Adam and, 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 and the second Adam, he's not referring to Eve. In other words, he lays the main problem of sin on Adam's. In other words, yes, it was Eve, but I mean, ultimately God says, you were the head. You should have said something, done something, whatever. The he implication is there. So, so that's ultimately your call. The buck stops with you, bro. Yeah. Not with Eve. You. Yes, Eve had her own judgment and all that kind of stuff but you know anyway we'll get into this but more or less he was the authority over her that's the way right he was God created first yes the, the idea is he, the you know, over her. Yeah. yeah so he should have had said no you gotta you can't do that i don't want to bite that apple <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah but he didn't yeah. he felt he succumbed to her wiles right so, you know, what they say is obviously men and women are equal in dignity. I don't want to belabor this because most of us know this, you know, the idea of the image of God, right? The image of God, the same Holy Spirit dwells in both of us, right? Mm -hmm. I've got a better Holy Spirit than Joanna does, right? Because I'm a man. No. no, same Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit, same one that inhabits children if they are open to him, right? Um, you know, men and women have different roles in marriage as part of the created order. Both Adam and Eve were created in God's image equal before God. Um, distinctions in masculine and feminine roles were ordained by God as part of the created order and should find an echo in every human heart. And here's, here's I think, the main point he's making here. Adam's headship in marriage was established by God before the fall and was not as a result of sin. That's right. That's the distinctive difference in the egalitarian position. The egalitarian position says, no, men head, men's headship came after sin. It's a reflection of the fall. But from a biblical, if you actually look at it, you know, God established that beforehand. And again, we'll get into this, but as evidenced by how he lays most of the culpability on Adam and not Eve after the sin. Does that make sense? Why but, does it matter in their argument? And I believe yes was given to the man before the fall. Why does it matter in their argument? When it was given, it was given. But they would say it's a sinful thing. That's why men... You, that's why men brutalize women. I mean, you can you can throw in all the man's inhumanity to man, so to speak, on women. Throw in rape, throw in physical abuse, throw in domineering, and all. They would say all of that is because man usurped a position after the fall. It was not given by God. It was usurped after the fall by man. And an orthodox biblical position would say no. That was there in Genesis one and two, pre pre-fall but but that's that's the main difference that's 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 what an evangelical feminist would say no man's authority over a woman is because of man usurping a role that was never there they were always just equal that's it there's no okay i'll say it this way because i get i get this in class when we start talking about a war i'll just say it i got a big problem with women in the military uh, in the infantry. Okay. Why? Well, first of all, I think a man's probably stronger than a woman anyway. And if I'm going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a really bad enemy, I want to win. Number two, I don't like what happens to women when they become POWs. 
So the protect tour in me says, I don't like that. Am I okay with women in other areas of combat? Yeah. You know, strategy, tacticians, you know, even piloting. There's, but what happens to people when they get captured, it's not good. And I don't want that to happen to women. That's my own personal view. Okay, you can disagree with me, whatever. But I, I bring that up in class because you're, you're a chauvinist. No, I'm not. Here, this is why. Do you want that to happen to your sister, your wife, your mom, your aunt? Do you want? No. So I got a problem. I, I think there's a, I, I just, I don't know. That's my thing. But anyway, but that's, that's a side thing. It's not, but, you know, I think there are different roles that women can play. Women just can be, you know, when you get into the, okay, what about employment and jobs and equal pay? Have no problem with women, various jobs and equal pay. I think they need to be judged on their own merit. I think it's a meritocracy. I don't think it's a, but when you get in the military, I just, I don't know. I just get a big thing against torture. Just do. And especially with women. I'm like, no, you're not doing that to my aunt. You're not doing that to my sister. You're not, you know, a guy should step up and go to the front and fight that. That should not be, but that's my, anyway. It's recorded for all posterity's sake. If you don't like me, send me a letter. Let's talk. I agree okay? with you. I love you. I think that's uh, exactly the way it should be. Yeah. Here's the Southern, here's the Southern Baptist Convention. Okay. The husband and wife are of equal worth before God since both are created in God's image. The marriage relationship models the way God relates to his people. A husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He has the God-given responsibility to provide for, protect, and lead his family. A wife is to submit herself graciously to the servant leadership of her husband, even as the church willingly submits to the headship of Christ. She being in the image of God as her husband... Um, as is her husband and thus equal to him has the God-given responsibility to respect her husband and serve as his helper in managing the household and nurturing the next generation. That is relatively uncontroversial. Is it not? It's not a trick question. I mean, generally, that's, you know, it's really simple. So let's, let's talk about, well, let's look at the egalitarian teaching on equality. This is evangelical feminism. Okay. The Bible teaches that both men and women were created in God's image. Cool. I'm there. Had a direct relationship with God. I'm, I'm there. Cool. Shared jointly the, the responsibilities of bearing and rearing children and having dominion over the created order. I don't have any problem with that. Number five. Again, there's a bunch of them. I just chose some of the more important ones. The Bible teaches that the rulership of Adam and over Eve resulted from the fall and was therefore not a part of the original created order. That's true. That is, that's why is it true? Because after the fall, that's when God put uh, Adam, how does it say, that she will be under him as far as like taking orders and all of that stuff. I'm not sure how to explain it, but it says that uh, he should leave his mother, what do I say here? Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, He shall rule over you, but your desire will yes. be for your husband. Something like that. Yeah. Okay, Doc, you disagree? Why? I do because it says that when he was created, that Adam was to be the protector and the ruler. And here, let's look at Genesis. Let's leave fell on. Again, let me read what, what the egalitarians say. The Bible teaches that rulers, the rulership of Adam over Eve resulted from the fall and was therefore not a part of the original created order. That's true. Can't find it in your book right now. I think two things. Number one, created in God's image. Was he created man in God's image? Um, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be truthful, multiply, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every fruit. But um, when he created man, and he took, he uh, ripped up Adam to become Eve. I mean, yeah, I think you could also, along with it, Man was created first, mm -hmm. so so that that is that is the strong argument from the uh, complementarian view to say that wait a minute this was pre-fall. Okay, 
okay? Egalitarians say, well, wait a minute, rulership of Adam and Eve resulted from the fall. In other words, it was like a usurping of a role he never had. Eve was created from Adam. He was a helper to Adam, but Adam was first. In other words, there was something derivative of the woman from the original man, indicating headship was pre-fall. That's part of the argument, along with what Doc was saying. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but but th that that right right there, number five. That is the big difference between complementarian and egalitarian positions. Headship for a complementarian is pre-fall. Headship is post-fall for the for the uh, egalitarians. The, number ten. The Bible defines the function of leadership as the empowerment of others for service rather than the exercise of power over them. The Bible defines the function of leadership as the empowerment of others for service rather than as the exercise of power over them. I got a problem with that, but let's see if you, where, where you at with it. It's not leadership, is it for serving others? I mean, yes, it is for serving, but they would say it's, the implication there is it's ex primarily for serving others, not to have power over them. Go back to Genesis 1. Who was put in charge of the of the animals? Okay, there is a twofold responsibility. Number one, stewardship. You're stewarding the earth. We're not going to just indiscriminately destroy it. But nevertheless, there is authority over. In other words, we're not just there to serve and steward. We have authority over animals. Animal husbandry, anyone, or something like that, right? In other words, there's something about that that that. Okay. My, my little Milo, well, he's not little anymore, but my little child, okay? We're, we're, we've taken him to dog obedience school. We've learned from this wonderful lady, I'm the alpha, not him. But he pulls me, when we go for a walk, like he's the alpha, right? In other words, from a biblical, if you're gonna train your dog, I'm in charge. I'm not just here to serve you. I'm gonna feed you, I'm gonna give you water, but I'm here to have authority over you. That's how God set it up. <laughs> but the tail, you know. But a lot of owners, and we've been this way. The tail starts wagging the dog. No, no, you can't do that. You, you see the difference there? We would say yes, we serve, but but there is a, a leadership also means having an actual authority. Someone, the book's got to stop with somebody. Someone's got to make the call. Someone's responsible, and someone is is, is accountable. Not just equally, but someone else got to be accountable. But when you say that, it sounds like you have power. Well, you, then, then you need to repent. You know what and what, you know. what you'll get into, because he said, uh, for a lot of women, they have a big problem with that word submit. Mm -hmm. But he said, where we get this concept of submission is in the Trinity, where Jesus submits to the authority of the Father. And that, that submission brings joy because it's reflective of God himself. I guess it's kind of what I'm saying, created like, in the like image of God. Yeah, yeah, and so part of that submit that, that Jesus is voluntary submission, right? In other words, yeah, he's gonna, you know, death and everything's gonna be laid at his feet, but ultimately he's gonna defer it back to God the Father. That's this idea that anyway, he's God, and yet he submits to his his Father in the same way that a woman submits to the husband. It's actually a beautiful thing, not a uh, something that will bring abuse. Now. Yes, is there abuse? Sure, there. We live in a fallen. Welcome to with life in a fallen world, people. Man's inhumanity to man. Okay, um, go back to Genesis four and Cain and Abel. There you go. Right, but that, in other words, so so they're just going to say it's just service. There is no author authoritative over concept. Number eleven, the Bible teaches that husbands and wives are heirs together of the grace of life. Cool, I'm fine with that. They are bound together in a relationship of mutual submission and responsibility. I would say yes as well. I mean, I, I, I submit to Christy even as she submits to me, but ultimately the buck stops here with me. But, I, you know, hey, 31 years, almost 31 years of marriage, yeah. There's times I've got to submit and yield and, and, and humble myself and say I'm sorry and all those kinds of things. It's not like, oh, because I'm in charge. No. It, it, and yet, and yet there's a final authority that God gives to the husband from a biblical perspective. The husband's function as head 
kephale, that's a Greek word, is to be understood as self-giving love and service within this relationship of mutual submission. I would say yes to all of that, but the implication is the husband is not the ultimate head because of, of number five, okay? And so I would say, wait a minute, hold, that, that's gotta be tweaked a little bit. You kind of see how that, this is, this might not be something that you think about a lot, but I, when I talk to Lexi, when her first year at Liberty in one of her theology classes, she's, she's like, dad, these kids get fired up about this stuff. When you get into the Baptist ranks, whoa, yeah, this complementarianism and egal, that, that, it's, um, them's are fighting words to, to good old Baptist. So it's interesting. She also said to me, <laughs> she said to me yesterday or last week is we went to this really great AG church. It's 1,700 people. It was a really cool church. And uh, she goes, Dad, I'm so glad I'm out of Baptist realm and I can get back to a Holy Ghost setting here. This is wonderful. I love this. And she also said, she, she said a couple of things that I thought were very theologically profound because they were singing. She goes, Dad, as, as in worship, she goes, Dad, figure this out. I said, what? You know, a lot of these, he said, uh, she said, are his hill songs and Bethel and them, they're all Holy Ghost, aren't they? I said, yeah, they are. She said, then I always had a problem with all these Baptists singing these Holy Ghost songs from hill songs and Bethel, realizing that they didn't really get the dynamics of actually what they're saying. I thought that was a really profound, you know, she realized, wait a minute, there's something when you're truly Holy Ghost that you begin to appreciate in the spirit that someone, yeah, they might be singing a really popular catchy tune, but they're not appreciating the reality of which they're singing. And she, you know, last, last week was really good for her because, you know, she, and he, I want to say this, I loved Liberty. I loved the whole experience. She loved the whole experience, but she was like, man, there's something about being home in the spirit that just, I, I need this. And so, so I'm, I'm happy with her, even though she had a secular setting, she's in a really good church, a really good, it's called Cross Church in Raleigh. Um, really good church. All right, well, hey, I need to close here. So that's probably good for today, but we'll get into more of this stuff next week, okay? All right, take care.